Welcome everyone to today's Industry Insight webinar, Optimizing Your Data for Better Performance. This is Marlis Furs, and I'll be the host for today's session. With me in the studio today is Jesse Davis, our Senior Director, Research Development for Progress Data Direct. Jesse is responsible for the daily operations, product development initiatives, and forward-looking research for Progress Data Direct. Jesse has spent nearly 20 years creating enterprise data products and has served as an expert on several industry standards, including JDBC, J2EE, DRDA, and OData. Jesse holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Engineering from North Carolina State University with a concentration in microprocessor architecture. Could you kick off the session for us today? Sure, thanks, Marlis. So, Today we're going to be talking a little bit about optimizing your data for better performance. We're going to start out talking through some industry trends, uh, and then we'll get into some specifics that will help you be able to better optimize everything that you do regarding data uh, based on things and findings that we have in the industry. I'd like to start out talking a little bit about Progress Software. Uh, we have a, an organization that gets up every day and thinks about how to better connect the world's applications to the most important data. Um, we have a huge product portfolio that's used by a broad range of customers spanning every vertical. We're a horizontal type of technology. We're not specific to any one vertical and a lot of different customers and a lot of different use cases find our software helpful. But I want to start off talking about uh, how connected we are. Um, I think back to when I was in college uh, or when I was younger and we didn't have uh, the types of technology that we have today, right? I remember the times before cell phones, which is very different than the generation of my children, for example. I have a son who is not at all patient when I'm traveling to another country uh, if the phone takes more than about 10 seconds to connect. He's used to living in a world, as are most of us nowadays, where you can get to anything instantaneously. There's no delay. You know, this webinar talking about performance, you know, we've really become impatient uh, as a species. We don't tolerate any types of delays. I remember in college when, uh, when Netscape, you know, we were surfing in the lab back then and you would say, oh cool, I'm gonna load this web page. You take a click, turn to your buddy beside you, you know, enjoy some coffee and have a conversation while the page loaded. Uh, today we get upset if it takes a millisecond, you know, or five milliseconds. So it's, it's very interesting to see how connected we are and how much we rely on performance to continue to improve the human experience as it relates to technology. Um, we're, we're used to sharing everything all the time, what we like, what we don't like, and we make it available for everybody to see. So we're much more open, right? I mean, we, we are a global community, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, we're very social creatures and we like to share what we find. Um, and each one of these times that we share or tracking activities and all of this stuff generates data, little digital footprints that we leave as, as we wander around planet Earth. Um, how do we make use of all this data? Um, how do we mine it so that we can better improve experiences for people or to enhance our businesses uh, in real time? Uh, Hulu's one interesting example. I'll sit down in the evenings and watch some TV with my wife and we get to choose our ad experience. We're even changing the way companies are presenting information to us by willingly giving them a little bit of information up front on what we're interested in. All of this is tracked. All of this is stored. Um, you'll walk into uh, a Macy's, for example. Macy's not only knows their application, not only knows that you're in their store, but through iBeacon technology, they can tell that you're in the handbag section or you're in the shoe department. These types of technologies, you know, go beyond geolocation where we just have latitude and longitude. We can track people within several feet of where they are in a building. These are the types of things that you want so that you'll be able to take that data, mine it with other information that you have about someone and present with them a coupon on something that they might actually make a purchase uh, right there and then on the spot. All of this is, is interesting and is bleeding into other sectors as well. So healthcare and life sciences, uh, they're coming up with ways to get a more complete picture of a patient. Uh, for example, you know, I had an injury not too long ago and uh, trying to get an x-ray from one doctor to another took four days. Four days to send one picture from one person to another seems crazy to me. 
and it seems crazy to a lot of other people as well. So there are companies working to, uh, to speed up this process, again, to improve the experience that we get uh, when we shop. And, and again, all of this stuff requires massive amounts of data, massive amounts of transformation that has to be done really, really fast. So um, to just show an example of how, uh, how much this is exploding, this interesting statistic I ran across that um, during the first day of a baby's life, uh, we generate 70 times the information contained in the Library of Congress. It struck me, I was, uh, my niece had her birthday the other week, and as my brother and I were in the kitchen, we watched, and there were five grandparents surrounding uh, Maya. She's one years old. Five grandparents surrounding her, and they took almost two gigabytes worth of pictures and videos of her eating a piece of cake. So <laughs> I can very much relate to the amount of information that we're generating. Whereas when I was born, well, I was one of three children, so I was lucky to get a single picture. But most kids, when they were born 20, 30 years ago, th there wasn't the technology available to generate this data. And this data stays and grows. Um, most children have online personalities now. All of this stuff starts at a much earlier age and continues all the way through adulthood. So. So people really want to mine this and make the most of it. These are some of the trends that we're seeing in the industry. Uh, so how do they do it, right? As data continues to grow, um, performance becomes a bigger and bigger problem. This is what we call the digital universe. This is at the forefront of everything we do. Data is at the basis of everything we do as a, as a society and as a human race. We use data to be able to predict weather patterns. We use data to be able to predict drought patterns, try to feed people, try to make sure that we have populations um, that are moving throughout our cities in, a, in an efficient manner. All of this um, comes down to data and how fast we can mine it, how fast we can make use of it, translate it, transform it, analyze it, and put it into making decisions. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. One of the other trends, um, that, that we're talking about is as all this information goes around, um, it, it's mostly a good thing. And companies and people that make use of this data do well. Amazon.com, huge online retailer, started out as a bookstore. We buy everything from Amazon.com, right? I mean, Amazon Prime is my girlfriend. As long as Amazon Prime delivers there, I don't care if I hit rock bottom. It's, it's that important to people, right? Airbnb, over 10 million bookings for bed and breakfasts last year and they don't have a single storefront. Um, Hulu and Apple, you know, we don't need to talk about them, but the businesses that don't embrace these new technologies and new customer engagement models, they don't do well. I look at Borders and Blockbuster, Kodak filing bankruptcy. Um, so one of the things that companies are starting to do, you may have heard this term of data lake, where um, it, it's basically you have all these streams that flow in and data is stored in one location. Right. I would I would posit that these data lakes, uh, if you look below the surface, are really many different repositories. You might have Mongo storing something, SQL Server storing something, Hadoop is part of this. Um, and on one side, you have um, all these data scientists. They're your fishermen and guys analyzing things, trying to find the next bit of information to pull out of the lake as they look for interesting facts that will help you run the business. You have data generalists and programmers uh, who tap into the streams for real-time analytics or then, you know, write your, your everyday code or use your BI tools and things like that on top of it to try to, to, try to pull information out that we can make decisions on. Um, and then on the other side, you have this idea of treating data coming out of the data lake to put it into your data warehouse, the place where you keep all of your clean stuff that you don't want to mix with anything else. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the techniques that we see people doing, and how, how that fits into the performance picture, uh, we'll get to in just a few minutes. Um, but one of the things I did want to bring up was the idea of the database wars, right? As we, as we start to find companies that are using these data lakes, underneath the covers, there's a lot of different choices that go into how you choose to store your data. What type of data is it do we want to store? How do we want to access that data uh, next week, next month? What types of reports do we want to run? Basically, what do we want to do with it? Or do we know what we want to do with it? Is this something we're going to give our data scientists uh, a project to figure out what we can do with the data now that we have it? Um, and as, the, as you start to figure out which storage solution works for you, 
uh, it can become a little overwhelming. And there's a lot of battles going on between the different storage vendors trying to figure that out. Um, as you can see from this, uh, this diagram over here from the 451 Research Group, there's a lot of choices. So one of, the, one of the first things that we have to do is figure out how to choose. And I would posit that that's one of the things that, that we're working uh, very hard in the industry to do is to simplify data variety choices for our customers. One of the ways that we do that is we take a, a typical example of someone writing an application, right? You know that performance is one of the first things on their mind. Um, and in the beginning, they think they're going to write this application, they're going to connect to one source. But six months down the road, requirements change, and they have to add in another source. Or maybe they have another project, and then it requires something different. So as you can imagine, point to point to each one of the different sources that could be available is a very tedious, time-consuming, and expensive thing to ponder. As you begin a project, what you really want to do is you want to think about all of those different sources. Um, how can I connect to them through one data hub? How do, you, how do you want to connect to that? You want one unified access point that can access anything in the cloud or behind the firewall that can be used with any type of BI tool and that is really, really fast. That's really what it comes down to. So let me give you uh, a little bit of a walkthrough on, uh, on what this means and how OData is fitting into the picture. Uh, ODBC and JDBC have been around for a long time and they're very good at what they do. They allow you to plug into things like Pentaho and Tableau and MicroStrategy and Informatica and whatever tool that you want. Um, and what we've really tried to do is make a hub in the cloud that you can access via ODBC and JDBC to get to any of your cloud sources, but also be able to tunnel through your firewall um, and be able to get to all your on-premise sources as well. Again, all with one single data hub that sits on top of um, all this different, you can look on this, this right side over here as your data lake, all these different pieces of, of data streams flowing in, but when you want to access it, it's through one simple hub. And through ODBC and JDBC, that gives you um, standards-based access that you've been used to for a long time. Uh, a new standard that we've been working with is OData. When you see OData, you should think REST slash JSON. It's, it's none other than a standardized REST interface. So anywhere that you would be able to get to a RESTful interface, you can use OData. So whether you're programming on you know, Windows Mobile, iOS, um, Android, uh, or you're writing something, trying to use Salesforce Lightning Connect to enrich your Salesforce data with something on-premise, OData can be there to help you out. OData was a standard originally started by Microsoft a few years ago. Uh, Microsoft realized that in order for this standard to really take off, they needed to move the standard to uh, an o the open group, an open standards body. Uh, they approached us here at Progress Data Direct. We've been known as the Switzerland of data access for, for many years now. Um, and so we co-sign that with them, and we sit on that standards body, just like we do ODBC and JDBC. It's the same thing that we've been doing for the past 20 years, making sure that we stay at the forefront of data standards so that it's more productive for individual coders, um, and it's also highly performant based on the architecture that we've chosen, which I'm going to cover here, um, some architecture slides, and, and show you why our stuff is fast and how you can make the most of it. Um, so we've covered a little bit. I talked a little bit about Data Direct Cloud, how it serves as a hub. Uh, but on-premise connectivity is still a popular requirement. Uh, so I don't want to leave that out of the performance talk. Um, so we're going to move right in here and talk a little bit about um, polyglot persistence. When we covered Data Lake earlier, I said not many companies use a single data, data store anymore. Uh, 15 years ago, companies would choose DB2 or they'd choose SQL Server. Uh, as their source. And they did that mostly because the data access options couldn't be swapped out back then. So you would be tied to a client library and you wouldn't have that flexibility to choose. Uh, but I was watching um, one of the engineers from Netflix uh, do a presentation on the architecture of Netflix and how, how they were using uh, the polyglot word basically is a, a marketing term in, in, in that sense to just show that there are applications that use more than one data source and these are increasing in popularity. Uh, your databases that you choose or your, your, your big data sources or you know um, data silos sitting in the cloud in an application, 
Uh, all of those different things need to be brought together so you can get a complete picture of things. And, you know, this is, uh, this is just a little bit to show you guys what we've been working on uh, in the engineering group here. You know, we've been building drivers for Pivotal and Mongo and Cassandra and Cloudera uh, while we still have a strong relational uh, foundation and then also building in Redshift and Dynamics, um, Eloqua, Service Cloud, um, Google Analytics, which is a really interesting source. We should do a, a little talk on that one as well for these multidimensional models. Um, but anyway, being able to access all of this stuff uh, in a highly performant manner is a requirement that we're, in, that we're encountering everywhere we go. Uh, so it's not just about meeting the needs of a single point-to-point -point connectivity. They want to go from a single point to many different places. So uh, now we're getting more out of what's happening in the industry around performance. And then we're going to start to dive a little bit deeper, peel that onion back and go down another level and start talking a little bit about architecture and how we design our software for, for performance, which is the same kind of lesson that you can use as you design your application. Um, and when we talk about uh, designing for performance, one of the first things that my engineers will do in the performance lab is they'll count the number uh, the number of calls through the stack from the time the application gets to us till we exit our piece of software and actually send a request over the socket. Right? Database drivers sit right on the socket. They're the last thing that you go through before you communicate to the database um, or the data source, I guess I should say. So uh, the way we used to develop it was we would build uh, this driver shim, which was ODBC or JDBC, which sat on top of the client libraries, uh, which then did a translation before it got to the database itself. A as an architect, you would look at this and you would say, wow, that's a lot of layers and it's a lot of dependencies. Uh, those client libraries uh, is not code that you own. So you have to wonder, you know, what were the compiler options that were used when you generated that? Uh, how many layers thick is that before you get down to the wire? What's, what's going on behind the scenes? And so what our architects did is we said, there, there's got to be a better way. What we should do is we should take the idea of the client library and squish it together with the top part and make just one layer underneath the application code that gr directly goes to the database. Um, or the data source, Salesforce, or something like that. There's fewer layers to go through. You have no dependencies on third parties. Uh, and then we can start doing some really interesting things at the code level, right? Since, since the database um, driver itself, um, or piece of connectivity software, sits right on top of your TCP IP sockets and your operating system, it, it can get right down to the bare metal. And we can do some really interesting things, like take... Uh, taking some C++ constructs that have come out in the last few years for concurrency models and how you can shift workloads among different processors um, and taking advantage of, you know, your thread pools. All of this stuff are techniques that we use in the wire protocol drivers to be able to make sure that we're getting the most performance out of what we're doing. And as an example of a recent success, um, we had a challenge. Uh, that as an engineering manager, I'm, I'm sure there's some engineers here and engineering managers uh, on the line with us. You can imagine that one of the field guys, um, who will remain silent, but you can find him on Twitter, um, he issued a challenge basically to my engineering team. Uh, before Oracle Open World this year, he went up and he said, um, basically, I, I, there's the Amazon Redshift driver takes six hours to load a million rows. He thought that was crazy, so he issued a challenge to my engineering team to build into our driver the ability to insert those rows uh, faster. And he said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do this live at Oracle Open World during my one hour session. My first reaction was not one of joy. My first reaction was, you know, I was frustrated. I was like, wow, he just, he threw this challenge down in the public, you know, out in social media and all my customers see it. What am I going to do? Um, so. You know, we got together with the engineering team and we said, we really need to figure out how we can make this work. So we went right back down to the metal like we always do. How can we figure out how to optimize our buffer management? How can we stream this data in um, in a more efficient manner? And it really came down to the same thing, right? You want to be able to compress any, any layers that you can in your software to be able to uh, get from point A to point B um, more quickly. And a lot of times we have arguments here amongst our engineering team, well, that violates encapsulation. Or, you know, I have, this is an object-based model that we're doing, and this violates object-oriented programming. Um, you know, sometimes if you go back to applications that were written years ago on older hardware, old C-style language, 
um, it, it's a lot faster because sometimes you can you got to really understand what's going on at the compiler level. So through this exercise, we came up with an architecture that um, that, that you know the night before we checked in the code. Um, and, you know, our field engineer was out there and we turned in uh, a million row insert in eight minutes. And, you know, there at Oracle Open World, everybody was cheering and having a party and all our engineers kind of freaked out and said, oh, my goodness, did we get it all in there? <laughs> so uh, we did verify the data uh, and it did make it in there uh, between eight and ten minutes. But th this is just an example of the process that we go through uh, whenever we're architect and driver and we're building these things for performance. It's what we do. Um, whenever you try to open up a, a, a piece of connectivity software, like you want to open up our Salesforce driver or you want to open up our Mongo driver and just take a peek at what's under the covers, here's kind of a, I don't want to call it architecture, I'll call it architecture diagram that kind of shows you what goes on between the application and whatever data source you want to connect to. Um, on the front end, you have your standard-based API, ODBC, JDBC, ADO.net, OData would be kind of up there. Um, and then a lot of this stuff seems, you know, pretty standard. You've got thread protection and statement pooling. And then as you go to the next level, you see NoSQL and JSON data normalization. Well, that's where you're going to start getting into Mongo, right? If we're going to, if we're going to make MongoDB be able to be fetched through JDBC or ODBC, we have to be able to normalize that data somehow. Um, and we have to be able to apply a schema on top of Mongo, which is, in essence, a schemaless data source. So a lot of that stuff's in there. Cloud data adapters, being able to connect to Oracle Service Cloud, uh, being able to connect to Marketo and Eloqua, these things that are, that are API-driven. How do we translate uh, select star from emails into a bunch of API calls on the back end? All of that's built into the driver. Um, you know, we do some intelligent push down. We try to figure out if the unit of work that you're giving us is better to be done here on the client side or off on the database or the data source side. Can the, can the data source that we're programming to handle the join that you've just passed to me? If it can't handle the join, then I need to do it here locally. So a lot of this kind of emulation and em emulating of functionality goes on to be able to give the application um, the most performant experience that we can give them. Uh, again, the socket and the network wire management that we talked about before, um, changing TCP IP settings, making sure that we understand how the, the different operating systems, whether you're on HP or AIX or a mainframe, how the buffering at the TCP IP level differs between that and Windows. These are all things that we try to, that we try to cover and that we try to make sure that we bake into our architecture as we go along. So once we design these drivers, we have to measure them, right? You can't improve anything that you can't measure. Uh, so this is an example of one of the, um, the graphs that we generate out of our performance lab. So down here at the, at the bottom, the number of threads from, from 1 to 10, uh, the amount of memory that's being consumed in megabytes over here on the left from 0 to 35 meg. And, um, you know, our, our driver's fairly consistent um, in the blue, and our competitor was, was using a lot of memory here, uh, and they've improved over time. But when we, when we saw this slide, we, we had the first thought, I wonder how many of our drivers we could run in the same memory space um, as our competition. And so we kind of did a little bit of um, magic here and just kind of added in and said, we think we can get about five uh, and still consume less memory. As an engineering organization, that wasn't good enough. We said we had to prove it. So let's go through exactly what we did. Um, let me unpack this slide for you. Over on the left-hand side, you have the number of threads from 1 to 10, which will simulate you know, a certain number of users. And going across the top, you can see uh, Virtual Machine 1, and all of these numbers are in rows per second. But you can see Virtual Machine 1, uh, then a little darker blue Virtual Machine 2 and 3, and then a total across all three. So in our lab, we set up three virtual machines, uh, and we ran ourselves versus the competition on each machine, um, and then aggregated them, right? All of them on the, same, uh, on the same physical box, so that we could tell whenever we were starting to hit um, scalability limits. And what we found is on the first virtual machine, uh, at 10 threads, we were getting a little over 15,000 rows per second. Um, and the competition was not doing as well, right? From the previous example, we knew they had uh, memory consumption issues. And if you'll notice that you can add up all three of them, and the total throughput on all three different machines was, come, was starting to come uh, a little bit over what we could do on a single virtual machine. 
So that's kind of a 3x, not a 5, which we thought of before, um, but a real a real world example of the types of throughput that we could get with our driver. Um, so what does this mean, though? I mean, why do we do performance? So we covered a little bit of the architecture stuff. We covered how we measure it. But to, to someone writing an application or running a development team uh, or having a new project, what does that mean? Well, performance really gives you options. You want to be able to make choices based on the performance of the software that you're using, right? One of those is to increase throughput. So in this example, say you had three machines, just like in our previous example where you were running uh, just under 16,000 rows per second for your application, you could switch out the connectivity um, and then get a 300% throughput, throughput increase. On the other hand, we've had some customers who wanted to do machine consolidation. So the throughput that they had was fine, but they were running out of space or they were generating too much heat for their AC system. Um, and those are the places where you can go in and then you can switch out and move to a smaller number of machines, smaller number of virtual machines, and get those cost savings. And we had a customer really interested in that. They said, well, I want to do some machine consolidation uh, because I run my lab out in Amazon. So we ran another test. This is our second test. We said, let's go ahead and set up in Amazon and uh, on, on the Amazon systems, we'll set up uh, some different client machines, some different server machines, and, and run some tests and see what we can, we can get out of this. And so here we have uh, our extra large machine, which has four CPUs and uh, a really fast network and tons of memory. Uh, and then we have large memory, moderate memory, and small memory. I can't remember what the numbers are. Um, and then we also, we vary the network in there with it as well. So we could, we could introduce a little bit of latency um, at the network level. So at the first machine that we ran um, showed some pretty good results, right? We were getting about 2x throughput uh, on this machine. Um, and again, on the bottom, you're getting 10 to 70 threads. So we were running a much larger test. And then your rows per second are still up, uh, up the left side. So here we're getting around two times the throughput on this machine, uh, which, is, which is pretty good. So we decided to run it on a larger machine. Um, and again, you start to notice that uh, competition getting resource bound at about 20 threads and starting to decrease in its output. And uh, we started getting resource bound a little over 25,000 threads uh, and started to decrease out to 70. So we still knew we had room to run, right? We still needed to get to the point where we could really blow the, 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 the competition out of the water. We wanted to see if we would scale and we wanted to remove these bottlenecks. Um, so we ran it on the extra large machine and got some really interesting results. Uh, here, um, you'll notice on the top, the blue line continues to scale. And, and it's, it, the, the competition is scaling as well. However, the, the angle of that line is much steeper, indicating that we're getting much faster, much quicker. Um, and then we said, what does that mean in terms of cost savings? So in, in the instance that we ran, if you were running 20 servers, Right, you would only need eight servers in this instance, which saved you 120 to 150 thousand in Amazon dollars back uh, when we ran the test a couple of months ago. On the on the flip side, if you were running a hundred servers up in Amazon, which is a very large deployment, you could get by with 39 servers, saving you uh, a little over half a million dollars. So this is a practical, real-world example of how we test our drivers after we architect them for performance to try to get this kind of, this kind of understanding of the choices that it gives to each, uh, each of our customers when it pertains to uh, uh, the performance things that, that we deliver. So I, I talked a little bit earlier about specifically what we do. And here I'm going to dig in just a little bit more without giving away any of our secret recipes. Um, but we pay attention to a lot of programming techniques and a lot of hardware trends. And I would recommend that you do the same. Um, there's been a lot of change in hardware over the past few years. And modern processors are very different than the processors from five or ten years ago. Right, the number of caches that they have, how they handle their buffers, um, all of these different things have changed. And as you get new compilers, whether it be a Java compiler or a C compiler, uh, they contain a lot of interesting tidbits on how you can really tune that code uh, to run on specific pieces of hardware. I'll give you an example. Um, for C++ a few years ago, uh, there were a couple of projects at some universities on introducing uh, concurrency and threading techniques. Um, 
statements, I think pragma statements, things like that, you could wrap around your code that would allow you to far, say this piece of code, this loop, I want you to unpack it and run it on four processors at the same time if they are available. And so we would end up having customers that say, I'm running this on a virtual machine and I'm not getting that, you know, that much performance. And we say, how many cores do you have allocated to that virtual machine? Right, getting to my last bullet, which says how virtual machines are configured. They said we had two processors allocated to that virtual machine. We, uh, they had more to give, so I said just try adding two more. They added four to that virtual machine and more than doubled their throughput. They were getting around four, uh, four and a half x um, improvement just by doing something like that. It all depends when you run your when you run your software. Um, what kind of mechanisms that you've done at the compiler level and at the code level uh, that will result in these types of performance. Intel has a piece of software called Intel Parallel Studio, I think, um, is something uh, that's interesting to look at. It'll help you with parallelism on Intel processors. Um, the same kind of constructs that are there, you can find, um, you can find uh, different documentation out on the web on how to optimize for other types of processors. Uh, the second one here, understanding socket management. So um, a TCP IP socket is what we use at the lowest level because it's the last communication um, channel that we have, that's how we communicate with the back-end data source, whether it's over HTTP to something like Salesforce or Eloqua, or if it's over just a raw TCP IP socket um, behind a firewall from the driver to an Oracle server. Uh, regardless what it is, understanding how to do session management, uh, how to do caching, how to do things like bun bundling up your requests um, to make the most out of, out of every socket um, call that we make. Those are the types of things that we're doing in the code that lead to the best performance. So some of these, taking care of all of these trends that happen out there in the industry, those are the types of things that we really want to pay attention to um, that we fuel into our software that you can fuel into your applications um, and that you, can, that you can then feed around and get a lot of performance gain um, as you start to try to process the, the deluge of data that should be coming into your company. Uh, I think about, um, you know, we had a good use case, and, and if you guys have been on some of our previous webinars, we talk about uh, King.com, which is um, the author of the Candy Crush video game which is highly addictive that I play on my iPhone and I, I have a love-hate relationship with that piece of software, right? I, I hate and I'm ashamed of myself that I've spent money on it, but they, they just know how I play and when to give me that 99 cent five extra moves and a lollipop to bust, you know, to bust through the next piece of candy. And what's interesting to me is since we know those guys and they, you know, we worked with them to mine their uh, Hadoop on the back end, I know that they take billions and billions of moves um, and, and learn the behaviors of the people that play those games and personalize the experience just for me. And on one hand, I'm really glad because it makes me, you know, have fun and, and enjoy the game and it makes it really addictive. Uh, and on the other side, it scares me to death. It's very big brotherish uh, of them to, uh, to try to mine that data. But, but, but they're doing it and they're making a good business model out of it. And the games that are coming out just continue to be more and more addictive for those companies who pay attention to it. But in order to process billions and billions of rows, they have to be running software that takes advantage of the latest hardware trends, the latest modern programming techniques, so that they can actually get through all that stuff in a reasonable amount of time to still be able to visualize it and make a difference for, for their customers. So another example uh, is Yamaha. Uh, so Yamaha had uh, an order management system that was run on IBM Windows. Uh, they decided to migrate that system over to SQL Server and Linux. I'm um, looking to save some money. Uh, Yamaha Motors, you know, known for their fast performance, which is why it makes it a cool use case for us. Uh, but as they moved over, uh, the sheer volume of data going through that application brought the system down. Um, and it was all due to performance reasons. So they were paying attention to tuning the application. They were paying attention to tune the back end. And it turns out that during the transition, they had switched from, uh, from one driver to a, a free driver that was given away uh, with SQL Server on the Linux operating system. And um, not to disparage Microsoft, but they're, they're not a Unix shop. They never have been. Um, and we are. You know, we specialize in a lot of different operating systems. Uh, our Linux driver was put in and uh, solved their performance. They got a 20x, so orders of magnitude, uh, faster than the other driver, which allowed them to continue moving on 
uh, in their system that they were replacing. So their order management system was back up. They were happy. Uh, great use case for us. Um, but just another example of something that you think should work. They had an, exi an, an application that was existing already. This application was working. It was working fine. They were moving for cost reasons. And they expected the connectivity to just be swapped out instantaneously and still get the same kind of behaviors. Um, but the connectivity makes a big difference uh, whenever you're trying uh, to, to get the most out of your order management system. So the last thing I want to cover uh, before, we move, uh, before we move on to a Q&A session here is whenever we get through, so we kind of took you through the concept of a data lake and how people are storing things, um, how fast the data is coming into those streams. We're processing that data in several different places in the company through several different personas. How that feeds into um, our different architectures and how you build and the explosion of data sources and how all that kind of stuff really needs to tie together. But in the end, the reason that we're getting all this data the reason that we're paying attention to capturing it all and storing it all and mining it all really at the end of the day is to make our businesses better and to give our customers an awesome experience. That's what the benefit of performance really is. Um, so on the back end of this whole webinar, as we talked about, you know, performance and optimizing your data streams and going through the, the whole process, at the very end, you want to visualize your data. You want to be able to make sense out of it so that you can make decisions in your business. And you might be using a yellow fin, you might be using Tableau, uh, Informatica, ODI. You, you, may be able, you may be using any of these um, uh, business intelligence or, or data integration type uh, pieces of software. And another requirement on top of performance is it's got to just plug in and work. It's got to be plug and play. It's got to be easy to use. And not only should it support and be able to use all of these different BI and DI tools, but there's all these other different protocols, ODBC, JDBC, REST, ODATA, all this stuff has to be supported because that's what these tools require. Um, and when you get the performance story right, when you get the code right, uh, when you get the support of all these, these different visualization tools, you can make something really, really powerful. Something like Macy's application that mines the data and figures out what you want. Something like, um, something like uh, the Yamaha use case where you're getting 20x performance. Um, all of these things feed in together uh, and make a really good experience for the people in your company writing the code. The, the management system that has to, or the, the business analyst that has to get these visualizations and make decisions on them. Uh, and then in the end, the customer who's presented with a good personalized product that they can use. So to wrap it all up, um, in the beginning, we talked about storing your information and your data lake, or then you access your data with extremely fast performance so that we can analyze the data through plug and play connectivity and present and distribute and share your findings. These are the things that companies are doing to make the most of their data, to optimize these data streams, to rely on performance, um, and to make the, the customer experience the best that it can be. We talked a little bit about the things that you can do and the things that you might want to do. Here's another one that you can do. The Redshift uh, trial, we have a special website that you can take the Million Row Challenge yourselves with our drivers. Um, you can choose the data integration tool that you want to use. Um, sign up for the free trial. This, uh, this stuff will be sent out in an email after the webinar. So you can give this stuff a run for yourself. Um, at this point, I think I turn it back over to Marlis, um, and we're going to do some questions and answers. Okay, great. Well, I have someone who is looking for your help. So I am in the process of testing ODBC. I've installed the 64-bit Data Direct Connect driver. I can connect to the OpenEdge 10.1b database using Access 2013, but when trying to link to a table, I get reserved error negative 7748. I have put both workaround and workaround 2 in my registry. I still get the error. I don't need immediate help, but um, if someone could reach out to me as soon as possible. My 15-day trial is now down to 10. Because I did you 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 remembered everything I just said, right? Uh, um, I really um, will not be able to help you with that <laughs> one sitting in the lab. Yes. Uh, however, we do have the communities, so I would encourage you to go post something on communities if you haven't done so already. 
um, contact our techno technical support team and we'd be happy to get up with you uh, as soon as possible. Extend that trial if we need to uh, and get you successful. Okay. I'm using Progress 10 b and Data Server for Oracle for 30 million insurance policy clients and using VPass product by McCamish. Now we are facing performance issues. How can we increase performance? Need to reach yeah, it sounds out. like it sounds like they're they're using our Open Edge driver. Um, to and I'm not familiar with McCamish, but okay. um, sounds like they're up and working. Okay. Um, the first thing that I would do is generate some log files for us. Okay. Uh, so that we can take a look at it. But um, we also have a list of connect options on our website that we might want to try. I know that. One of you guys said you were trying the Workarounds Connect option. Uh, we do have performance sections in our documentation. Yep. Uh, or contact our technical support. One of the things that we do is we treat uh, performance issues um, with a really high priority here. So if you will contact our technical support, we'll be, we'll be happy to help you. Okay, next question. Do you have ODBC drivers for a company formerly known as Par Excel? Par Excel, yes. Um, we do have some drivers for Par Excel. Um, they're limited availability, but if you contact us, we'll be able to help you out with that. Great question. Okay. Customer has Oracle version 6.1. Do we have the correct driver for it? Oracle version 6.1, you would have to use an older version, not our, not supported in our latest ODBC and JDBC pack. Um, but if you give us a call, um, we'll look back through our library. We should be able to set you up with an older ODBC driver from a previous release that supports that. However, Oracle version 6, that is the oldest version of Oracle that I've heard in a long time. Um, I think, yeah, that was, uh, that's an interesting use case, so I'd be interested to know what you were using it for still today. Okay. Will free trial DataDirect ODBC be available for our own database, let's say Oracle, instead of Amazon? We have drivers for Amazon Redshift, we have drivers for Oracle, and you can get a free trial of any of those, yes. Okay. And is the Linux driver faster than the Windows driver? Is the Linux driver faster than the Windows driver? Um, that's a good question. I could check our performance charts. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, we try to run on the exact same hardware where we do our performance tests, so it's tricky. I mean, Linux is not the same as Windows. Uh, in general, things run better on Unix than Windows do, but um, off the top of my head, I, I, I'm not sure that one would be any faster than the other if you get them both from us. They'll both be fast. Okay, a question about JDBC standard. Is JDBC 3 or 4 supported? Yes. They both are? Yes. Okay. And as a matter of fact, to drive home the point that we sit on the standards committee, we have a meeting next week to discuss a, uh, a new JDBC um, edition in um, the version 9 JDK. So we started planning that and uh, working on a new sharding interface. So that should be coming to a database driver near you. Another question. We are using DataDirect with IBM DB2. We are converting some legacy apps to Silverlight with WCF RIA services. The problem is DB at schema name are different in dev and prod. How to make the schema name within the entry framework data model configurable? That's a good question. We do have some connect options for a DB2 driver. Go to our documentation and search for schema. And there are different options that we have in the driver that let you do things for schema name. Um, I'm not sure which one you're talking about or, or, or exactly what metadata that you're, you're seeing this in. But um, especially if you go against an iSeries or a mainframe DB2, uh, we allow you to set and change your schemas. Um, so you should go check the documentation, search there for schema. He and says iSeries. Oh, it is AS400. Okay, yeah. So we have some stuff um, in our documentation specific for iSeries and mainframe because they do things a little bit different than the Windows uh, and Linux versions of DB2. So go check that out. It's a good question. Just search for schema in the online documentation um, under the Connect Options section of the DB2 driver. Okay. Is it possible to connect COBOL applications with DataDirect? That's an interesting question. Um, we do have drivers that run on Z Linux. Uh, and we do connect to uh, DB2 running on the mainframe. Um, we, uh, we do have ways to plug in COBOL. So if you have a COBOL stored procedure on the mainframe, um, we will be able to execute that through either our JDBC or ODBC drivers. Okay. Is there any chance to use DataDirect and improve performance database queries? Absolutely. 
So I, I give you an example of some of the things that we do. Sometimes we do what's called a lazy prepare. And what we'll do, uh, you'll, you'll issue, you'll, you maybe use a prepared statement in JDBC. You create a prepared statement and we don't send the prepare over the wire. This goes into the socket management and buffer stuff that we were talking about before. What we'll end up doing is we'll chain those together at the wire level, the prepare and the execute and the first retrieval of rows. And so instead of doing three different operations, it goes to the database as one stack, offloading the work from the client to the server. Um, and we improve performance there. Another thing is how we formulate those SQL queries directly impact the, um, the query execution plan on the back end, and we do the best that we can do to optimize those as well. Uh, if you're looking for other tips and tricks on how to optimize your SQL statements or your other, um, your other programming techniques for ODBC and JDBC specifically, we do have a book that was written by our CTO, John Goodson, um, and uh, Vice President of Research and Development, my boss, Rob Stewart, on the, the Data Access Handbook. Uh, inside there, you'll see a lot of different code examples and things that we do, uh, things that you can do practically as you're coding your JDBC and ODBC applications. That'll help you out there as well. So, yes, great question. Okay. Does your driver support batch mode? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, we go beyond batch mode in some cases and do bulk. If you search on the... Uh, the website, you'll see that we've done bulk webinars in the past, but I'm happy to talk about it for just a minute. Y you've got the idea of batches in JDBC or parameter arrays in ODBC. And the idea is that you would send all of these statements to the back end at once or the array of parameters and say, insert a whole bunch of rows all at one time. So yes, you will be able to do a batch mode, but on top of that, you have another mode that's even faster that you get to choose if you use a progress driver. Uh, that mode uh, we call as bulk loading. So uh, a feature of a lot of different databases back in the day is they would ship these separate applications outside of the driver, outside of the database that allowed you to load massive amounts of data very quickly. We actually took that idea and built it into the drivers themselves. So over the wire, we'll use BCP, which is the bulk loading for, for some of the database vendors. Um, or the CLI load command for DB2. Well, we actually built that into the driver. So what you can do is instead of using batch mode, um, you can flip a bit. This is enable bulk. And on that batch, if we're able to, we'll use a different communications protocol with the database. Um, now, there, there's some warning flags there. So you have to understand whenever you're doing bulk, it is a lot faster than batch mode. But there's also, you don't do uh, integrity constraint violation checking. Um, you don't check uh, the, the, the data as well and things like that. So you can actually insert, um, in some bulk mode, you can actually insert more characters than is allowed uh, in the column. But again, you flip that bit, it takes that batch mode uh, and then um, supersizes it to a bulk mode to insert it even faster. Uh, on top of that, we have a bulk API that allows you to insert uh, data from CSV files much more quickly. So you can actually load a CSV file directly into the database um, using one of our drivers. And in, in JDBC, uh, in the last webinar that I did, we were able to do that in five lines of code. So that's pretty cool. Which brings to the next question, which driver is fastest against progress, JDBC or ODBC? Oh, <laughs> that's a loaded question because I'm a, I'm a Java guy um, and I'm always at odds with uh, some of the, the guys that, uh, that were on the ODBC team. So there, we do have two teams, an ODBC team and a JDBC team. Uh, I came up through the JDBC side, and there was always this battle on who had the fastest drivers. Um, I will say that the ODBC drivers uh, here lately, and I'll say lately because we have, a, we have a really neat website and some dashboards that are up around the office that kind of show the competition. So there's, they're, they're always fighting to get ahead. But um, depending on the driver... Um, the one that, uh, that pops to mind is the, uh, the ODBC DB2 drivers just screaming fast lately, um, and it's beating the JDBC driver. So that's the one that comes off in my head. I'll, I'll say it there. You know, if you've got a specific driver, um, we can tell you. But um, sometimes those guys that are not in, a, you know, not in a, a, hot, a hot compiled type of a runtime can eke out a little bit better performance gain. Okay. Is there a community edition of your driver? A community edition of our driver. Sounds like you are talking about MySQL, and the answer there is no. Our MySQL driver only connects to the enterprise version of MySQL. 
Okay, does your driver support two-phase commits and in parentheses JTA transaction compliant? Absolutely. So JTA, you're a JDBC guy asking about um, your distributed transactions on that side, and yes, we do. All right. Currently, I'm using Oracle 11G for insurance policy provider in India. Okay. Using Oracle Data Server to access the same from ABL code. Now only 6 million policies are migrated and system facing issues. So at each migration stage, we'll need to tune up code. To what extent DataDirect will help us? Do we need to contact them afterwards? Yeah, I'm not really sure what yeah. driver you're using or what your data store is. It sounds like you're using ABL, which makes you, you're using OE. And I don't know if you're, if you're saying that you want to use, move from OE to a C app and use the ODBC driver or the JDBC driver or uh, what exactly that use case is. It sounds like we're going to need to dig on that one, and we're okay. not going to get that in five minutes. All right, and we're going to take one more question, and then we're going to wrap this up. What has to be done to go across a firewall with your driver other than a specific port? Is there any software that needs to be installed locally? For our standard ODBC and JDBC drivers, no. For our, data, our new DataDirect cloud, um, yes. So when we go through the firewall, the first thing you do is you download a small piece of software. We call it our on-premise connector, and you configure that back behind your firewall. That allows that on-premise connector uh, to be configured by DataDirect Cloud to connect to any of those sources that you have behind your firewall. You can expose whichever ones you want, choose not to expose others. Um, and then that was what will talk back through your firewall to our, to our service that's running in the cloud and be able to map that data and fetch it back no matter where you are. All right, Jesse, we're going to wrap it up. We have some more questions in the queue, but we will get to everyone after today's session. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. This session has been recorded and will be available for everyone that has registered in an email that we will be sending out. Again, thanks so much for attending. Thanks, And guys. thanks, Jesse. Bye, guys.